Not that long ago, dietary fats were vilified and blamed for weight gain, high cholesterol, and many other problems. Today, they're having a bit of a revival. Olive oil and even butter are back on the menu, and some fat replacement foods that were once kitchen staples, like margarine and shortening, are not nearly as popular as they used to be. Here's why. Research revealed that obesity and heart disease are far more complex problems than can be explained by a little extra fat in the diet. Plus, having too little fat in your diet is definitely a problem. Our goal in this video is to help you determine the significant upside of a diet rich in healthy fat sources without having to spend lots of time measuring or counting them. You can take a targeted quality focused approach to fat. We'll show you how. Fats are not just part of your diet, they're a major part of who you are. To begin with, even the leanest person has plenty of stored body fat. The average man has about 100,000 calories of stored fat as compared to the 1,500 to 2,000 calories stored carbohydrate known as glycogen. This stored fat is crucial. It insulates and protects your vital organs and it is also your body's primary source of energy at rest and during low intensity exercise. Fats do more than just fill up empty spaces in your body though. Fats do not get as much prestige as muscle tissue, but body fat helps form cell membranes and is a major part of many organs, including somewhere around 60% of your brain. More actively, fatty acids also act as cellular messengers, helping proteins to do their jobs, and also help you store and process essential nutrients and vitamins. They're also essential for regulating levels of hormones such as testosterone, and low-fat diets have been connected with decreased testosterone levels. Dietary fats, you're no doubt aware, come in many forms, which can sometimes be hard to remember. There are saturated fats, which come primarily from animal sources like meat and dairy products, and some tropical nuts like coconuts. Another way to remember this is that saturated fats are solid at room temperature. Then there are polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats, which more often get labeled as healthy fats. We get these from nuts and seeds, certain vegetables like avocados or olives and fish. And finally, there are what are known as trans fats. These are naturally occurring in some cases, but artificial trans fats are also added to many processed foods to enhance taste and texture and for frying. Artificial trans fats or partially hydrogenated oils have been connected with heart disease and inflammation and other serious health issues and are best avoided as much as possible. People talk about these fats like they're dramatically different, but honestly, the difference is often just a single hydrogen molecule here or there. They are all made primarily of long chains or tails of carbon linked up with hydrogen. If every carbon molecule has a pair of hydrogen mates, it is considered saturated. If even one of them links to another carbon instead, it's unsaturated. Why mention this? To show that fats share more than they don't, both in how they're built and in how they function. Both saturated and unsaturated fats are also present to some degree in all of the fat-containing foods you eat, and so are trace amounts of trans fats. Point being, when it comes to adding fats to your diet, the differences only become problematic when you dramatically over-rely on one type or the other. The same goes for two types of fatty acids that you've no doubt heard mentioned plenty in recent years, omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids. These are considered essential because we need to get them from our diet, and they're both present in everything from a porterhouse steak to a walnut. Neither of these fats is good or bad. It's all a question of overall balance. For example, Omega-6 fats, which are located in abundance in many meats, vegetables, grains, and oils, have important health properties. But when we eat them to the almost total exclusion of omega-3s, as many people do, then they end up negating the good effect of the omega-3s, like their anti-inflammatory and disease-fighting capabilities. In that case, the omega-6s can end up potentially causing inflammation. The same goes for saturated fats. They're both healthy and necessary on their own, but when they're all you're getting and when you're consuming primarily from nutritionally questionable sources like highly processed meats, you'll find yourself at risk for a wide range of health problems, including cardiovascular disease and even diabetes. The goal for health and performance is to get away from a 10 to 1 omega-6 to omega-3 ratio to more like a 4 to 1 ratio. It's also to tip the scales more towards unsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats, eating them about twice as much as you eat saturated fats. So how do you do it? It does not have to be complicated.
Some early studies connected overall fat intake with cardiovascular disease, launching the low-fat diet movement which dominated our culture for several decades. But more recent studies have concluded that the type of fat that you eat are more important than the precise quantity. However, it's worth repeating something we've said in other videos. Namely, the entire landscape of your diet matters far more than the details. That applies to fats, proteins, calories, everything. Put it in more tangible terms, a single pastry isn't going to do any harm to you even if it has trans fats in it. Seriously, it won't. But if you eat that same pastry so much that it becomes a dominant trend in your nutrition, then we're talking about something different. This is the way to think about your fat intake as well, in terms of patterns and consistent choices, not an occasional treat. Here's a simple one sentence way to get maximum benefit and minimal risk out of dietary fats. Get most of your fat from non-meat sources like nuts, seeds, and vegetables, and have some at most meals. That might sound overly simplistic, so let's break it down a bit more. What do things like raw walnuts and cashews, egg yolks, fish oil, and olive oil have in common? They are first and foremost fat-rich foods. They may have some protein or incidental carbs, but comparatively very little. Compare that to something like a fatty beef ribeye or bacon. These are more like fatty proteins, not fat sources, and not surprisingly, they are rich primarily in saturated fats. Are they bad? Not in moderation, but they're not an ideal way to get the majority of your fats. And they're pretty easy to overeat, especially when they're ground up into a burger that you know you're going to finish no matter how big it is. The same goes for what you might call sugary fats. Ice cream is definitely something you could call a sugary fat source. So are sugar-coated nuts or cakes and muffins. They're high in fats, but they're also high in sugar and processed carbs, making them easy to overeat and hard to control when it comes to knowing what type of fats they contain. Rather than obsessing over types of fat, we recommend simply knowing your best fat sources and prioritizing them when you assemble your meals every day. For instance, almonds are high in healthy fats, which is good. A small handful of them in a salad or about 23 almonds may have the same fat content as a bowl of ice cream, but it's a different type of fat and it definitely has a place on a healthy plate. The same goes for say, a half an avocado. It may have the same fat content as that bowl of ice cream, but nutritionally, the two are night and day. In a salad or mixed in with some wild rice pilaf, there's nothing at all wrong with it. Of course, there are exceptions to this rule of avoiding fatty proteins and sugary fats. For example, whole eggs and salmon are both definitely fatty proteins. The same goes for those almonds. But in those cases, this doesn't make them a problem food, it makes them a great food. Some other fat and protein superfoods include, well, other fatty fish like sardines, salmon, trout, mackerel, anchovies, mussels, and even oysters. While the fat content in foods like these and in nuts and seeds definitely makes them calorie dense or energy dense, you want to think of it as food as fuel. They are also undeniably nutrient rich. Don't fear them, eat them regularly. If your dietary preferences allow it, eat fish at least a couple of times a week or more. Grilled salmon is great, but you have far more choices than that, so explore them. Keeping in line with the hands-on portioning from our carbs video, a thumb-sized portion of an added fat with nearly every meal of healthy fat sources is an easy way to control what you're getting and keep your proportions in line. A thumb of walnuts with a lunch or a thumb of olive oil dumped on your salad or grains may not sound like much, but it adds up and that consistency is what counts in the long term. You could think of our rule another way. When it comes to fats, think quality first, quantity second. Even in what seems like a dawning of age of fat, there is still a big difference between a diet rich in healthy fats and a diet that's packed with junk food fats. Rather than looking for a trick like low fat ice cream that seems to allow you to eat junk food more often, start by getting enough quality fat in the right portions in your diet regularly. Then when you want a fatty treat, enjoy it for what it is. Don't be afraid to eat the full fat ice cream. The low fat version usually has so much sugar, it cancels out any benefit and is just as easy to overeat. Have a little, enjoy it a lot, then get back to normal.